Acts chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 11. Now, whenever you share the gospel with others and you share that Jesus came to reveal the Father to this world, to take the penalty for the sins of men, our sins, and to die and to rise again from the grave, you know, many times people will say to you, well, how can I know that this is true? How can I know that this actually occurred in history? And so how do you respond to someone when they ask that question? I think it's very important. If you don't have a really good answer, hopefully you'll take what I'm going to share with you this morning and use that as your example of what you can share with people and give them the best evidence for the resurrection because there is plenty of it. Now, this is not the only evidence for the resurrection. There is plenty more. But these, I believe, are just the best evidence that you can use to share with people that Jesus is alive. And so let's just read our text here this morning. Verse 1 of Acts 1. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive, after his suffering, by many infallible proofs, or literally, that is, indefensible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall we receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and the cloud and received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, Behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So what are these infallible proofs that Luke records here and refers to concerning the resurrection of Jesus. You see, infallible proofs are what you need to share with people. They are indefensible proofs. And proof is what this world needs. They need to hear the proof because there's plenty of it. And so what are these proofs? Well, the first is the most obvious here. In these first three verses, Luke records for us that Jesus showed himself alive for 40 days while the disciples were meeting with him in different places. Now, this is very interesting because eyewitness testimony is probably the most powerful evidence of all. Eyewitness testimony that occurs, well, at least 14 times we have recorded evidence of people 
or groups of people that saw Jesus alive after his crucifixion and his resurrection. And so it's pretty obvious that this is a critical part that is described in Scripture over and over again, that people actually saw him alive from the dead. Now, there are probably more than 14 occurrences. We just have only 14 occurrences recorded for us in the Scripture. Because the Scripture said, Jesus said himself, that many other things he did. As John ended his his, his gospel, he basically says there are many more things that he did that are not written for us, but these are written that you might believe. So I have, I think, really good, a good basis to state that there are probably many more times that Jesus revealed himself alive. But what are those 14 times? Well, first... He revealed himself to Mary Magdalene. We read it uh, this morning, John 20. She was the first one to see Jesus alive. And then a group of women who were coming to meet and to uh, take care of the body of Jesus, they saw Jesus alive. Then there were two disciples walking on the road to Emmaus. And Jesus walked with them, spoke with them, and all of a sudden, they re, were, it was revealed to them that this was Jesus that was crucified. Then fourth, he revealed himself to Simon Peter alone. What a revelation that must have been. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall listening to that conversation. The one who had denied Jesus. And Jesus went to him personally to reveal himself to him and to reconcile with him. I'll bet you that was a tearful moment. And then the final appearance on Easter Sunday, that first Easter Sunday, was the ten disciples in the upper room when, when only Thomas was missing. And he revealed his hands, his side, and he spoke with them. And then sixth, the next week, with the 11 disciples, Thomas being present, then the challenge to Thomas that was read this morning. Come and see the holes in my hands and my side. Put your hand, if you want to, into my side. I mean, that's pretty powerful evidence. And then the, dis the disciples on the shore of Galilee where he fixed breakfast for them after they had a, a night of fishing and they had caught nothing. And then Paul mentions one of the most impressive appearances where Jesus revealed himself to over 500 disciples all at one time. Now, that is really a powerful example of proof. Over 500. And as Paul writes there in 1 Corinthians 15, he tells them there, well, let me read it to you. 1 Corinthians 15. He says in verse 5 through 8, it says that he was seen by Cephas and by the twelve. And after that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present, and some have fallen asleep or died. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles, then last of all, he was seen by me also, referring to himself. And so Paul mentions these occurrences to James, to the 500, to the disciples again, the 11th uh, revelation, which is in our text this morning. Just before his ascension, he reveals himself again and then ascends into heaven in their sight. And then, 12th, Paul again when he was in Corinth in Acts chapter 18, when he was in the midst of great persecution, it says there that Jesus appeared to him and comforted him and told him, 
don't be afraid. I'm with you. What an assurance, a personal assurance that must have been to him. And then the 13th occurrence is when Paul was caught up into heaven and he saw Jesus. And then the last is John on the island of Patmos when the Lord revealed himself to him. So these are eyewitness accounts. Peter said in his epistle, 2 Peter 1.16, For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. An eyewitness. Now, eyewitness testimony is held very high in our society today. I mean, when you go into a court of law, what do they do? They call witnesses. And if you are an eyewitness testimony to the crime that's committed, you are almost certainly to be convicted. I was just on a criminal trial here not too long ago on the jury. And the police had body cam video and dashboard cam video from their cars. And I'm telling you, it's, you, are, you become the eyewitness. You see and you hear everything that is said and done. And we convicted that man because he was in violation of the law. And it was an obvious, easy thing to do. Eyewitness testimony is powerful. And we have multitudes, hundreds and hundreds of people who saw Jesus alive. Now that's powerful evidence. If it is used in a court of law today, you should, you should receive it as this is a historical record that we have just read. And it is one of the most ancient historical records that we have in print today. Eyewitness testimony. But that's not all. Secondly, the most practical proof of the resurrection was the personal evidence. You see, Jesus was not going to leave the disciples alone. He was going to send the Holy Spirit to fill their hearts and, their, and, and transform their lives. That evidence was dramatic and it was personal. You see, every one of you here this morning, if you are a Christian, the Holy Spirit lives inside you and you have become his witness. You have a personal testimony, a personal testimony of how he has changed you. And that testimony is what you share as a personal testimony. You're not an eyewitness testimony, but you're a personal testifier of what he has done in your life. Now, that is pretty powerful because without the Holy Spirit, that could not be. There would be no transformation in your personal life. There would be no personal way for you to know that he was alive unless you were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now that's what Jesus tells them here in verses 4 through 8. He tells the disciples that they are going to experience this, what he calls the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now, when they first believed in Jesus, they received the Holy Spirit. This is found in John 20, verse 22. It says, when he had said this, the verse previous to this, he had said, peace be unto you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So John 20 is exactly where they became born again. That's where they received the Holy Spirit and became believers as you and I are believers today. And so the Holy Spirit comes into you the moment you believe in him. But Jesus here is promising in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, 
that they are going to experience this baptism in the Holy Spirit that will enable them to become his witnesses, bold witnesses. It's an overflow. That's what the word baptized means. It means to overflow with the Spirit of God. And that's what changes and transforms a person's life. He comes into you when you believe, and Jesus here is promising that there is more of the Holy Spirit. And I can guarantee you, for every single one of us in this room, there is always more of the Spirit of God. If you will open up your heart and you will ask, He will empower you and He will flood your heart with His life. This is what Jesus said in Luke eleven thirteen. He said, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father, which obviously the intent here is because He is good, And he is loving as well. How much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The word ask there is in the present tense. Which means those who continually ask. That's why I'm absolutely assured there is more of the spirit that he wants to give you than you have yet experienced in your life. And all you have to do is ask. And keep on asking. And he will fill you, flood you, and change you. And transform your life. This is what you need if you want a transformation of any part of your life. This is what you need if you're going to be a powerful witness for Jesus Christ. You need the Holy Spirit. So I challenge you this morning. Open up your heart. Ask for his this personal evidence of his transforming power at work inside of you. Then thirdly, there is the predictive evidence of the resurrection. Now this is also here in verses 4 through 8. Because what Jesus does here is he tells them, he predicts to them exactly what's going to happen in 10 days. He said, not many days from now which we know from the scripture was just 10 days later, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they were filled with the Spirit as he promised here. Now Jesus did this continually. He predicted things to take place. Now why did he do that? It's very simple. Predictions are only and can only be done By God himself. Because no man can make any kind of prediction. Except he is. It is revealed to him by the spirit of God. And by the power of God. God is the one who knows the future. Jesus knew the future. Which revealed to them. That he was more than just a man. That he was God come in human flesh. That he was come here to reveal the Father to all mankind. And so he predicted things to come because prophecy is found all through the Scripture. There are thousands of prophecies in the Old Testament and there are hundreds of prophecies in the New Testament. It's it's a powerful thing to, to realize that God can speak and predict what is going to happen in a person's life. And so he predicts here, this is what's going to take place. And so he reveals that he is someone outside of man's time domain. He is from eternity. And he will return to eternity. Now, the reason why I bring this up is because it is a fact, it's a proof of who Jesus was. He was not just a man, but that he was God come in the flesh. We know that because only God can predict the future. This is where God challenges the false gods in Isaiah chapter 41, verses 21 through 23. 
Now, notice the challenge here that the true and living God makes to the false gods of Isaiah's time. He says there, present your case. This is what he's saying to the false gods. Present your case, says the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons, says the king of Jacob. Let them bring forth and show us what will happen. Let them show the former things what they were, that we may consider them and know the latter end of them. Or declare to us things to come. Show us the things that are to come hereafter, that we may know that you are God's. Yes, do good or do evil, that we may be dismayed and see it all together. Now, I wonder if Isaiah was standing right in front of a bunch of idols at this very moment, and he was talking and prophesying to the idols in front of the people and saying to these stone gods, let's see you do something. Let's see you talk. Let's see you tell us what the future is going to hold. And it would have been obvious, a little stone god that man has fashioned with his own hands is not a god. So it's an obvious thing. Predictive prophecy is proof of who Jesus is. And the most important thing is, you know that Jesus predicted his own death and resurrection? That's why I bring this up. It says in Mark chapter 8, verse 31, there it says, He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes to be killed, and after three days, rise again. So, if God is the only one who can predict the future, and Jesus predicted the future, then he is that one true and living God. He is more than just a man. But Jesus also knew the future of the Jewish nation. What would happen long after he was dead and risen again and ascended into heaven? It says in Luke 21, verse 24, referring to the Jewish nation of Israel, it says, They will fall by the edge of the sword. They will be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles were fulfilled. Now, the Gentiles were controlled. They controlled the city of Jerusalem up until 1967. Did you know that? And that is the first time the Jews ever took possession of the city of Jerusalem since the time of Christ. Is that just a coincidence? I don't think so. Because that's a part of a whole bunch of other prophecies that reveal to us that we are in the last days. When the scripture tells us that when the Jewish people come back into their homeland, and they possess the city of Jerusalem, the Lord said, I will come again in my glory. So you better get ready. He's coming. But Jesus also knew the very specifics of this destruction. He told the disciples when they were, in Matthew 24, verse 2, when they were showing him the temple and the buildings and how glorious they were, Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. So Jesus predicted the destruction of the temple, which took place about 33, 34 years after he made this prediction. Because the Romans came and destroyed the city and the sanctuary, and they led captive all of the Jews into all of the Roman lands and dispersed them. 
just as Jesus said. Now, I have a picture of the proof of that prophecy being fulfilled. You see, when you go today to the city of Jerusalem, there is no way archaeologists can ever find where the temple even stood. They have to guess because there's nothing left. So in the picture that you're seeing here, this is a first century street. And the wall to the right there is the temple mount. And above would have set the temple. But they destroyed the everything that was there. Not one stone was left upon another. And you know where those stones were pushed? They were pushed off the temple mount onto this first century street. And there they sit to this very day. Those are the stones from the buildings that Jesus predicted would be destroyed. The archaeologists left them there as proof of that destruction. Pretty powerful. That's proof. But Jesus also knew who would believe, who would betray him, and he knew who did not believe. In John 6, 64, it says there, But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. And so, Jesus knew every single, he knows every single person's heart. Only God knows the hearts of men. He knows your heart. He knows my heart. He knows exactly what we believe and what we do not believe. He knows whether you are a true Christian. He knows if you are not. And so my question to you is, do you know? Are you sure this morning? If you believe that you are a Christian, are you sure that if you died today, would you go into heaven? Would you stand before him and be accepted and received into his presence. That's only a question you and God can answer. And so I encourage you, consider this. This is why he's brought you here today if you're not a Christian, if you're not walking with him and following him, because he wants you to be challenged. He wants you to make a decision today. You see, Jesus said, you're either with me or you're against me. There isn't anything in between. There is no place for you to sit on the fence. You're either with me or you're against me. Those are his words, not mine. So I I pray that you will consider that. So if Jesus knows all of these things, and how much more does he know about you? And does he know what you need? And all you have to do is ask him. And he will direct your path. Now the fourth evidence of his resurrection is the historical and circumstantial evidence of his resurrection. Now, what are these historical and circumstantial evidences? Well, there are many of them. Let me just give you two. Two that I think are really powerful. The first is the most obvious, and that is the empty tomb. There's nobody in his tomb. Now, we have a really pretty good idea where that tomb was. I have a picture of that as well. This is called the garden tomb. This is our church group that we took here not too long ago, getting ready to walk inside that tomb. And it's right at the foot of a mountain called Golgotha. It says, which means the place of the skull. And in that face of, the, of that mountain, you can still see the face of a skull today. And so, it's very interesting. This particular site there in the foreground, you can see a, a pedestal from an early first century church. There are many of them, one to the left there, almost out of the picture. And this was a place that a first century church was built over this site. And so, 
who would have known where the tomb was if it wasn't a first century group of individuals that believed in him. And so every other religious leader has a a tomb that's occupied this morning. All great, the great figures of men, all the political leaders, they all have their tombs, their graves. But Jesus has no tomb that is occupied, that is. It's empty. There's nobody there. Why? Because he's risen. The second historical and circumstantial evidence that I think is powerful is that all the disciples, including Paul, were persecuted and they were tortured. They were martyred for Jesus Christ, confessing the fact that they believed he was alive, confessing the fact that they had seen him and touched him and ate with him. That's powerful. Now you say, well, you know, anybody can, you know, hang on to a lie and profess a lie. To death? Would you, would you die for a lie? I don't think so. Chuck Colson uh, made this statement. I read it the other day. Somebody posted it, and I thought this would go perfect for our study today. Now, Chuck Colson was one of the Watergate conspirators back in the Nixon days. Remember him? He said, I know the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified that they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. And then they proclaimed that truth for the next 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured that if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world. And they couldn't keep a lie three weeks against the pressure of legal scrutiny. You're telling me that 12 apostles could keep alive for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. I love that. Nobody's going to lie. Nobody's going to go to their death for a lie. It's not going to happen. You're going to say, I was just kidding. I really don't believe that. I'm not one of his disciples. Now the last proof, fifth, the ultimate proof of the resurrection is the evidence of the second coming. Now if you wait for this proof, you've waited too long. You're in grave trouble because you will be standing before him in judgment. But this is the ultimate proof of the resurrection because he is coming again. Jesus said to his disciples in John 14, 1 through 3, he said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions or literally many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now, I'm I'm looking forward to my death or his second coming or the rapture of the church. I'm looking forward to that because that is what's ahead for every single one of us, one of those options. And so, which one will you be in? Will you be in the rapture of the church? Or will you go and you will see his second coming? That's up to you. It's your decision. It's your choice. But I wouldn't bet your life on the fact that he won't return. That is not a bet I would take, okay? If he predicted all of these other things, this prediction will come to pass. He will return. 
And you will stand before him one day. Every one of us in this room, every one of us on this planet, every one that has ever lived and stood on this earth will stand before him and give account to him one day. Why is all this evidence so important? Because it proves that Jesus is the Messiah promised in Scripture. He is the Savior of the world. And every one of us here needs saving. And that is the point of my message this morning. This is the best evidence for the resurrection. If you will accept this evidence, you should accept him as your Savior. And you should follow him. And you should believe in him. And trust him with your life. He is the promised one of Isaiah 53. It says there in prediction concerning the Messiah. He is despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows. Acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So he has paid for my sin and your sin. All of it was laid on him. That's why he had to die. But the resurrection is the proof that that sacrifice was acceptable to God, the Father. He accepted it. It says in Romans chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness. How? By the resurrection from the dead. He is declared to be who he claimed to be by the resurrection from the dead. And so my my challenge to you this morning is If you believe in him, then ask the Lord to fill you with the power of the Holy Spirit that you may be his witness. If you don't believe in him here today, accept this evidence and accept him as your Savior. Let's go to him in in prayer. Father, we thank you so much that you have given, Lord, just not words on a page, but you have given true evidence and proof that you came and died and rose again. And Father, I pray that you would take that evidence and Lord, may it sink down in our ears and in our hearts and Lord, convince us and cause us to walk boldly and confidently in faith before you. Lord, reveal yourself and your power in each of our lives here today. And if you're here and you are not following Christ, you're not a Christian, or maybe you used to walk with him, but you aren't today, I want to call you and and challenge you to come back to him or to receive him for the very first time right now, right where you sit. I don't want you to leave here without that opportunity. How do you do it? You do it by prayer. You do it by inviting him to come in and take over your heart, your life. Asking him to forgive you of your sins. And if you'll do that, then he will come in and he will begin that that transformation of your life. If you want to do that with me, you believe you're a sinner, you believe that Jesus died and rose again for you then pray with me right now. 
and just say, Lord, I believe that you came and you walked here on this earth. I believe that you were the Son of God. And I believe that you died for me. Jesus, come in and take over my life. Forgive me. Transform my life. Change me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit right now. And begin that work inside me. I want to be your disciple. If you just prayed that prayer here with me just now, I'd like to ask you to make a confession of faith by lifting your hand here and just saying, yes, Steve, I prayed with you today. God bless you. Anyone else here? God bless you. Lift it up so I can see. God bless you. Anyone else here today? God bless you. Father, we pray for these lives that you would transform them, change them. Lord, that you would reveal yourself to them. Lord, reveal your power as you have promised. And Lord, begin that work even at this moment. Lord, we trust you to do it. We trust that you are doing it just like you did it in our lives. And Father, we pray that you would keep these that have made their confession today. Keep them all of the days of their life. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we welcome those of you that made your confession today. We welcome you into the kingdom. Amen. Amen.